Welcome to Kingdom Perspective Broadcast, the teaching ministry of Dr. David Ogaga. We believe that this message is going to open up the seals and cause you to have a deeper revelation into the Word of God that will make you see beyond the letters in the Word. Here is Dr. David. Let's pray. Father God, once again, we thank you. We bless your name, Lord. We exalt your holy name. And we thank you once again for this moment, this privilege, your opportunity. You're granting to us, Holy Spirit of God, to look into your word. And we demand, Holy Spirit, that you cause your power within us to spring forth. Even as the word comes in, deep calling unto deep, O oh God, so that we can truly stand before you with wisdom and understanding and taking delivery of that which you've made available to us as saints, even at this hour. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Okay, yesterday we started on this, uh, the power of his resurrection. And this now will be part two, second section. And uh, I do hope that you got some understanding yesterday as to the purpose and the reason why we have to be where we are and to celebrate what we are celebrating. Praise God. Let me quickly uh, continue from where I stopped yesterday or give you a simple definition. I said it that the Jews they celebrate that which is called Passover as a religious obligation, if you can quote, that has to do with Moses which has to do with the coming out of Egypt to the promised land. So, it's like a memorial. They try to remember what God did. Bringing them from Egypt through the Great Sea and on and on. And then I said, normally they have it for about seven to eight nights in this celebration. But then I said for Christians, we celebrate that which is called Easter, which is more or less night. Praise the Lord. And the Easter that we celebrate is about the burial or the dead burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I tried to be very emphatic yesterday that it is not just about what you do yearly. It must go beyond that because Revelation 1, it tells us the person we are celebrating is alive forevermore. It's not a dead person, so we are not doing a memorial service. Neither are we remembering anything because this man is alive. Praise God. And so, so what exactly are we celebrating? In quotes. I'd like us to read from the book of 1 Corinthians 15, reading from verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse number 13. Hallelujah. Bible says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, now this was an argument in the Corinthian church. You have to understand that most times when Paul was writing to the churches, he was writing to correct and to bring solution to the confusion that they were having and the debate that they were having. So he is about if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not reason. Now I want you to follow the argument here. Verse 14 says, And if Christ be not reason, then is our preaching vain. And your faith also is vain. Follow that. I need to see how that your faith is tied to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain. Your Christian walk can amount to nothing if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By implication, the impact and import of resurrection, which has to do with Easter, 
is that we have a living faith by that singular act of Jesus Christ. He be raised. Verse 15 says, Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. Now here Paul again is tying the resurrection to the core message that they were preaching. And letting people know that Christ is raised by implication. The summary of our Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you take time to study, you begin to realize, oh, thank you, Lord, that even the death, I mean, the, 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 the birth of Jesus is not as important as his resurrection. You didn't get into faith through his birth. Your faith is tied toward his resurrection. But, but if you look at what we do, we, we celebrate the Christmas much more than the resurrection. Which is Easter. If you truly want to follow what the scripture is saying, there is more value on the resurrection than on the bites, which is December. But we lay emphasis on Christmas much more than Easter. But your faith is utterly tired. Because you see, when he died on the cross, your sins were forgiven. But that your sins were forgiven doesn't mean you are born again. Your sins are forgiven doesn't mean you are not part of God's family. You can forgive somebody who hurts you outside, but it's not your family member. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. The cross speaks of your sins being forgiven. So if you want to think about the bat, yes, he was born as a human being, he died on the cross. Exactly. But the truth is this. You were not born again on the cross or through the cross. Rather, you were born after the cross when he rose from the grave. Without his resurrection, you are not a child of God. I want you to see how important insight ought to be to us. Hallelujah. And this is the core message that Paul and others were preaching. But let's be honest. You look through the New Testament, you're not going to see anywhere there is the issue of Christmas. Am I correct? You're not going to see that. It even references to it in quotes, other than maybe uh, the epistles, I mean, the, 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 the gospels that might you all of those places. You are not going to see that. What you see in the New Testament, in the epistles, is about the resurrection. We have to do with our life. I want you to compare this so that you can see how important this season is supposed to be to us. This is when we are supposed to evaluate our life as to whether we are truly born again, as to whether we are truly in the faith, as to whether we are walking by his life. Because it's only when he rose that we have life, not when he died. Don't forget what I said. Your sins were forgiven when he died, but you became alive when he rose again. And what we're talking about in relation to Easter is your resurrection life. Hallelujah. Look at verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Oh, glory. Did you get that? If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. 
<laughs> oh, glory. So that's why I said, in as much as it's so important for you to rejoice about the birth of Christ, what really places you in God's family is his resurrection. Proudly you said to be a Christian because he rose again from the dead. And because of that which is called Easter. Are you with me? And this is very important that we understand what the scripture is saying. That's why we need to place our value where it's supposed to be. But like I said, very unfortunately, we consider the Christmas celebration more than the Easter celebration. And it's unfortunate. And that is because of the way we've been raised, the way we've been brought up, the way we've been taught, the way we have uh, had it as a way of festival religious ceremony, the case may be. You don't see the scripture talk so much about his birth, but you see the scripture talk so much about his resurrection. Because that's where Christianity is. Christianity is not in the bed, it's in the resurrection. Are you with me? Praise God. So, this gives us a clear definition and purpose of the resurrection of Christ. Simply put, your sins are forgiven through his resurrection. Amen? So, when we're celebrating this, it should be done with our understanding. It should be a time of rejoicing. It should be a time of glory. Glory in what? My sins are forgiven. I am happy because my sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. I'm happy because God brought me into his family by reason of this singular act of his resurrection. I became a child of God because he rose from the grave. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, sins are forgiven in Christ by his resurrection from the grave. This is very important. And you must understand that when you rose from the grave, in John 16, it talks about the promise of the Father in Acts chapter 1. Remember that? Good. And what happened? It was because he rose from the grave that the Holy Spirit came. Now, if the Holy Spirit never comes, you were never going to be born again. The promise of the Father is tied to his resurrection. So, you're ever being called a Christian is simply because he rose from the grave. That is why this period ought to be a very, very significant period. And it's a time you evaluate your work with God. To know exactly who you are. And to take advantage of the fact of this knowledge. That you are truly born again because he rose. So you can't contain. Where there is no contention in this regard is. You have it absolutely sure. That he rose from the grave. And because he rose from the grave. You have it absolutely sure that your sins are forgiven. You don't need any debate about that. Because the sins forgiven is tied to his resurrection. So you can get confused in your mind to thinking that, well, you don't know if you are saved, you don't know if your sins are forgiven. You can't think about that anymore. Why? Because you know he rose. If you are doubting whether your sins are forgiven, it's like you are doubting whether you rose from the grave. So if you don't believe in his resurrection, then you can believe on the fact that your sins are forgiven. So, if you believe that you rose from the grave, then have the double assurance, your sins are forgiven. Praise God. Are you following me? Good. So, this will be something that sits within your spirit regularly. Anytime you remember, think about this, anytime you remember his resurrection, you should have faith, my sins are forgiven. Amen? Praise the living God. Anytime you think about his resurrection, joy should flood your heart. Thank you, Jesus, for the resurrection, for my sins are forgiven. 
And Paul is saying, if there is no resurrection, then you are still yet in your sins. So, don't condemn yourself by not believing in the resurrection. Because if you don't believe in the resurrection, then your faith is in vain, then your sins are not forgiven. And if your sins are not forgiven, then you are not a child of God. So your being the child of God is already connected to the fact that he rose from the grave. And not just that, because your sins were forgiven because he rose from the grave. So your faith is tied to his resurrection. Your faith is not tied to when he was born. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. In John 1, 59, the Bible tells us that it's a lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. So the one that was on the cross was the lamb. Now the process of your being forgiven is not complete until the blood is shed on the most holy place. With the Lord of Moses. When they offer the lamb, the priest will take the blood to the most holy place and sprinkle the most holy place. Then the glory of God appears right there. He comes out and tells the people, your sins are forgiven. So your sins are not just forgiven on the cross. The blood must get to the presence of God. Give me Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. <coughs> Excuse me. Hallelujah. For Christ is not entered. Okay, let's take it up. Verse 23. 23, 24. It was therefore necessary that the priest or the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with this. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than this. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. That is physical temple. Which are the figures of the true of the true. But into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. You know what he's saying here? This is the role of his priesthood. Now this is what he's saying. You remember in Luke and John as well. When Jesus rose from the grave, Mary was supposed to touch him. And he told Mary, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my father and your father. You remember that? What do you think he was saying there? He, then he has not fulfilled this particular verse of scripture, which is verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 9. Because as a priest, once the blood had been shed, the priest must take the blood to the most holy place on behalf of the people. It is when he comes out from there that he blesses the people and announces to them that their sins are forgiven. Their sins are not forgiven in the course of crucifying or killing the lamb in the outer court. Their sins are forgiven only when the blood has gone to the most holy place before God. Are you following me? So Jesus told Mary, don't touch me yet, but our implication, go tell my brethren, your brethren, that uh, I have risen. Go to Jerusalem and tell them that you saw me, as the case may be. That same day was when he came in. In Luke 24, when the doors were shut and everybody, you know, they were all worried and so on and so forth. Afraid of being persecuted, whatever. And Jesus appeared in their midst. So what happened? He fulfilled the scripture as a high priest. Now he comes back to them to let them know that God has accepted their sacrifice, which is not their belief. Now, this is the point. You have to believe that he is the lamp of God for you. Because ordinarily, like with the Lord of Moses, you have to go with your own blood. Is that okay? With your own blood in terms of your own animal that you bring for the sacrifice. Which the priest will offer. And like I told you before, all the animals that they were bringing, they do not have the perfect blood. And so, God had to provide his own lamb. He had to provide his own lamb, which is now called the lamb of God, John 1.59. So now, it is for you to believe in the substituted Lamb of God for your own to have acceptance before God. And when that is done, so now your faith is tied on the fact that he has done this, meaning 
you don't have need for personal sacrifices or bringing animals because God brought his own animals which you not believe in. So you are saying, God, I agree and I accept the animals you offered in my place. But he say your sin are not still forgiven until that blood is taken to the most holy place. Are you getting this now? Good. So this is what you find in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. The blood has to be taken to the presence of God on our behalf. He say now to appear in the presence of God for us. The appearance. Take it from another translation. Maybe message. I don't know how it comes out there. The appearance for us now is he took the blood, went to the most holy place and presented it and said, here is the blood of sacrifice. And God seems to accept that blood and then he comes by like Aaron would do unto the people and say, the Lord bless you, may his face shine on you. You understand that? All of those statements that the priest begin to make, the high priest, is because he has gone to the most holy place and presented the blood and God has accepted the blood of sacrifice. This is when their sins are forgiven. So the sins are not forgiven when the animal is killed. The sins are forgiven when the blood is accepted. Come on, praise God, somebody. Are you getting it? For Christ didn't enter into the earthly mansion of the holy places. He entered a place itself and offered himself to God as a sacrifice for what? Our sins. Did you get that? Praise God. So this is a mystery of your Easter. What is that supposed to mean? This is when you have the conviction that the blood of sacrifice speaks for you. Your sins are forgiven because the blood was accepted. Because you know what? Even if the animal is slaughtered and it's supposed to be with blemish or spot, the blood will not be accepted. So, they have to examine the animal. Thank you, Jesus. They have to examine the animal to find whether it has fault or wrinkle, whatever the case may be. Is that okay? So what happened in Matthew 27? You see, the high priest came and they were talking to him and they were asking questions. What do you think they were doing? They were questioning him to find out whether he has fault in his language. The love of God was questioned right there. What was that? They wanted to prove whether this one is without spot or wrinkle. And then the priest came and said, we find nothing in him. That means he was an innocent blood. Are you getting that now? That was a trial. So that time they were trying him, asking him the question. They wanted to find out as high priest whether he has spot in his life. And this is what you have to think about as well. As a child of God, you should be free from spot or wrinkle. Don't think it is too hard. You can. How I many of you remember the power of silence? Amen. Jesus was silent. He knows who he was. The thing is, if you know who you are, no matter what anybody does, it has no effect in your life. You know why I say that? You can even serve better if you know who you are. You will not assume any authority. In John 13, if you look at the story very well, in the upper room, I mean, yeah. You know what happened? The Bible says, knowing that is the son of God, he took the towel and tied his waist and began to wash his apples' feet. Knowing that is the Son of God. Hallelujah. That understanding makes you to do anything. It can't be taken away from you. Your sonship cannot be eroded. Your sonship cannot be taken. Your something cannot be messed up no matter what you do. That consciousness enables you to do anything that serves people without thinking twice. I'm saying you can't be a son without the resurrection. Hallelujah. So get it right. It's because your sins were forgiven. That's why God accepted you as what? His son. And that's what we're celebrating. That is what we're talking about. So what are we saying? We're saying thank you Jesus for the blood. Thank you Jesus for the resurrection. For that's what makes us children of the most high God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are we following here? All right. So sins are forgiven. Why? Because he rose from the grave. And when he rose from the grave, he presented the blood of sacrifice before the Father. And the Father accepted the blood to be a good one, a clean one, spot without wrinkle, yes. And so, our sins were forgiven. And not just that, instantly too, following, the Holy Spirit came and unite with our own spirit. And now we are called the sons of God. 
So Easter is what defines your true sonship. Hallelujah. Amen. If you choose to do this yearly, I have no problem with you. But it must go beyond the yearly celebration to walk in your life. Amen. Because if you put it, thank you, Lord. If you put it on a yearly, yearly celebration, it simply means we have to be offering the sacrifices yearly too. Otherwise, we are going to be getting born again every year. Do you understand what I mean? If you put it on a yearly festival, that means you are indirectly saying, this is now April. We are born again. We believe because of resurrection. Then between this April 2023 and April 2024, we shall have gone out of being sons of God so that we can be born again in April 2024. This is what we're doing. It makes no sense. Do you follow what I've just said there? Because the purpose of Easter is for you to say, I am born again. You are celebrating the fact that you are born again. You have the faith now that you are born again. Why? Because you rose from the grave. So if you put it on a yearly sacrifice, that means every year you have to be born again. For you to have the joy and the recognition that of the truth, you are celebrating Easter. Because the celebration has to do with, I am born again of the Spirit of God after resurrection. And now, you put it on a yearly festival, that simply means you have to, you have to be unborn again, to be born again every year. And that makes no sense. But that's exactly what we're doing. Praise the living God. Are you following what I'm saying at all? That's what we're doing. So, but you see, it's ought not to be so. This is ought to be a new way of walking. Once you are born again, you are born again. You cannot be unborn again. Praise the living God. That's what I'm saying. It's not something you celebrate every year. It is something you celebrate daily. With the consciousness of the fact that, yes, I'm born again. I've got the spirit of God on my inside. God walks with me. God lives in my life. I rejoice because he is my life. Praise God, somebody. Again, Colossians 3 now. Look at Colossians 3. Verse number three. Hallelujah. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in who? In God. Your life, your daily life, it's not just what you do. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, the Christ is not going to be dying every year. Therefore, you cannot be celebrating the festival every year. Except you're taking it to be like those of the Jews who were doing their yearly Passover celebration. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me show you something. First Corinthians 5. Look at chapter, chapter 5. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. Okay, now here is a, a brother in the faith that slept with the father's wife. And Paul was given recommendation now to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Anytime I read the scripture, something comes to my mind. It makes me start thinking, is Satan totally bad? <laughs> Praise God. No, I just, it's a question I'm asking. According to the scripture, here is a brother that had problems and Paul is recommending, just send this guy to Satan to do some work on him so that his spirit might be saved. Is Satan totally banned? I don't know. I'll leave that for you to answer. The next thing, verse number six. Your glory is not good, know ye not that a little leaven living at the whole lump. Go to verse seven. For you are therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye unliving from even Christ our Passover. A sacrifice for us. Even Christ our Passover. Go back there. Verse number 7. Even Christ our Passover is what? Sacrifice for us. 
Did you get that? Are you following? Okay. So yeah, it's like the Jewish festival. They, they go sacrifice in, you know, in Egypt. Fourth burn sound and all of that happened. The lamb were slain. They came out of Egypt. So Christ our sacrifice or our Passover lamb makes her out of the world into a new kingdom. That's what he's trying to say. He's trying to compare your new faith with the world you were living before. Okay, look at the next in verse number 8. Therefore, this, this, this is the good part of it. Let us keep the feast. What feast? The feast of Passover or now the feast of Easter or the feast of a living bread. Is that okay? Let's keep the feast not with old living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness, but with the unliving bread of us, sincerity and truth. Take it from another translation. Just this verse. How do you celebrate Easter? This is what I'm showing you. This is not what you do yearly. <laughs> Amen. So let us live out. Praise God. Our part of the feast, not as raised bread swollen with the yeast of evil, but as flat bread, simple, genuine, and pretentious. Take it from Amplified Translation. Hallelujah. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Now we do live in, now we live in a mal, I mean, vice and malice and wickedness. But with the unliving bread of purity, nobility, honor, and sincerity, and what? Unadulterated truth. It's telling you how to live your life. Now, this is not what you do yearly. This is what you ought to be doing what? Every day. So the celebration is daily. Hallelujah. Are you following what I'm doing here? The celebration is what? Daily, your daily life. What truth do you have to share? I mean, do you still keep malice? Do you still walk in wickedness? Then you are not celebrating the feast of Passover, which is Easter. To celebrate the feast of Easter is to live out the newness of your life in truth, in sincerity. In plainness, no deception, because this has become your real life as a child of God. Hallelujah. This is what it means. So, it's not the thing we do every year, carry palm trees on our head, walk the street, and go and look for him in Galilee. You know, we used to do that when I was, uh, yeah, CSE church. Go to the forest in the night. What are you going to Galilee? You know. Yeah, we do all of those things, come back, carry palm trees and walk the street, all of that. No, you see, that's a matter of nothing. You do all of those things and you are not still who you are supposed to be. It doesn't make you a child of God. Easter is a daily lifestyle. Praise God, somebody. A lifestyle of truth, a lifestyle of simplicity, a lifestyle of nobility. You know what it means to be noble? A lifestyle of honor. Hallelujah. This is something you do daily, not yearly. So what we are doing at this moment, the world over, the truth is we lack the reality, the truth, the mind of God in that which we are doing. So it's more of religion. But the truth of it is this. You live out this life on a daily basis. So you check yourself. This season is when you really need to evaluate yourself. I said that yesterday. How much of the truth of God is manifesting in your life? How sincere are you? How, how noble are you in your actions and dealings with people? Amen? That's how to celebrate the festival. That's how to show forth that you are resurrected. That's how to show for that the power of resurrection is working in your life. Because now you are a new law. You are a new being. You are a new person. Hallelujah. When I look at your face, I see all of you. I don't have to see your face and there's something else in your mind. When we discuss anything you tell me, 
I take it for yes. It has to be let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't have to tell me yes and I end up discovering he said no you mean. I don't know if you are getting this. That is not the way to celebrate Easter. And somebody will say, but we are human beings. That's why there's power of resurrection. The power of resurrection enables you to live the truth of the life of God that is now on your inside. Praise the living God. No tricks, no games. You are just playing. That's what the Bible says. The celebration of Easter. Let's take one more scripture. Look at me now. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. We're going to continue from here. Tomorrow. Romans chapter 6. Um, look at it from verse number 3. Hallelujah. Amen. It says. Know ye not. That so many of us. As we are baptized into Jesus Christ. We are baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism. Into death. But like us was Christ was raised from the dead. By the glory of the father. Even so. We also should walk what? In newness of life. That is the point. Resurrection equal walking in newness of life. And I, I'll keep repeating this. Walking in newness of life is not what you do yearly. It's a daily, daily lifestyle. Praise God. Walking in newness of life is what depicts what Easter really means. It was shows that yeah, Jesus rose from the grave. You also rose together with him. By implication, the old living, your old self is dead. This is your new self that came out of the grave when himself came out of the grave. Hallelujah. So we're talking about walking newness of life. In your language, in your conduct, newness of life. As compared to your old life. That is Easter. That is how God intended to celebrate Easter. It's a new walk. It's a new day. Hallelujah. And guess what? The power of the Most High is available for you to walk this walk. And Paul will say, I can do all things through Christ that does what? Strengthen at me. It's on your inside. Like I showed you yesterday. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that Christ in you strengthens you. Gives you the ability, thank you Jesus, to be able to walk the walk, to be able to live the life that they have ordained for you. And that life is the Easter life, which is what? The resurrection life. Which is what? The sonship life. Praise the living God. Now you are a child of God, born of the Holy Spirit. And God intends you to live that life. And guess what again? Jesus will make a statement. Thank you Father. The prince of the world comes, but he shall find nothing in me. That's the work of Easter. Hallelujah. No ability of the enemy to possess you, to confuse you, to mess you up. I keep telling you, Adam never committed a transgression, the Bible says. Why? Because walking in a dimension of life before the fall that the devil cannot so, if you have wrong thoughts to do what is not right, don't blame it on the devil. Take responsibility for it. Amen? Praise the living God. Why? Because you have power on your inside to be able to overcome, to be able to resist anything that wants to mess up your true spiritual sonship. You've got the power on your inside. The power that raised Christ from the dead, that same power is resident in you. And it shall quicken what? Your mortal bodies. Praise the living God. Giving you a new life. Giving you a new spirit. Amen? This, friends, is what Easter is all about. Again, I repeat. It's not a yearly festival. It is a daily walk. In the life of the spirit of Christ. Which has given unto us. To walk in love. 
to walk in faithfulness, to walk in joy, to walk in true fellowship with one another. That is Easter. This feast must be celebrated with the newness of life, not with old life. Shall we pray? Thank you for listening to Dr. David Ogaga. We know you have been blessed by this station. You can share this message with your friends and loved ones. For more information, inquiries, and free downloads, please visit www.davidogaga.org. God bless you.